have the exciting segment to hear uh, from Lily Dragnev, uh, the Peace Action National Engagement and Campaigns Manager. And the first time I think you're joining a Peace Action main event, at least in quite a while. So our warmest welcome and thank you for uh, for being here. Break a leg, Lily. Am thank you for having me. Thanks, Jim. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm I'm so honored by by Martha and Stephen's invite to join y'all today. Uh, I've definitely had the privilege of knowing Martha since I began with um, Peace Action, and I think she may have mentioned to folks helping her set up some lobby visits and get to know um, you know your members of Congress and tell them about these important issues. And um, you know, Jim mentioned Schumer and his. Oh, what was it that you called him? Excusability. I, I feel like in Maine. Excusiology, yes. I feel like in Maine, Susan Collins is very much one who <laughs> made folks familiar with excusiology. Um, so, you know, certainly have to make sure that uh, the activists out there stay on her. And I super appreciate that you do. Um, I'll, I'll keep it brief so y'all can move along with the rest of your board business. And luckily, I don't have quite as exciting of a life as, as Jim has lived, so not nearly as much to um, discuss. But I guess my own experience, to just get into that a little bit, um, and diving into the peace movement, sort of began young um, and, and really kind of as an outsider in. So I was born and raised in Bulgaria. And so my childhood was spent, um, you know, behind the Iron Curtain um, in post-communist, post-Cold War era Bulgaria. And, you know, obviously I've heard the stories of what it was like to be in that quote unquote Cold War, um, but I got to see what comes out of even just a cold war versus a hot war and obviously the threat of nuclear weapons and that looming danger that they presented to the buffer zone countries I mean that's essentially what Bulgaria was part of it was just that little strip that was expendable for the Russians between the west and the east um, and, you know, I mean, it wasn't necessarily a nuclear weapon used, but um, Chernobyl and the meltdown there greatly impacted my, my own family. My mom was eight months pregnant at the time when that meltdown happened. And, you know, knock on wood, luckily my brother was all right. Um, and my, my grandfather happened to work for uh, the township. And so he got warning from friends and, you know, through the grapevine that we shouldn't eat any of the crops that year. And, you know, other Bulgarians were not as fortunate. And so you've certainly got crazy rates of cancer in people that are far too young to be developing cancer. Um, and, and, you know, Bulgaria is just one of the many countries that was impacted by that. And obviously the cover up and everything else that happened with it. Um, and, you know, just seeing that even again, the Cold War had such fallout um, and also being able to recognize the, the difference between the haves and have nots, having grown up in a place where we were one of those expendable countries again that that really just you know after communism collapsed fell into economic ruin um you know food lines and and waiting my grandparents having to choose between spending their pension on you know food or medicine because everything just disappeared overnight in terms of the economy <clears throat> and the corrupt profited and you know the the people of Bulgaria really suffered um and the west didn't seem to care anymore you know it was a big deal at the time when we were strategic assets um you know but they supported Greece and Turkey and then just kind of abandoned us and so um my own home country's history has always been on the receiving ends of wars in the modern era you know um the world wars, the, the Axis powers just coming it on in and, and taking over and forcing us to fight their battles and, and having my you know home people in this land have to be everyone else's soldiers. And so then coming to America, it was this huge reversal, right? Where suddenly I'd grown up with this mentality of being on the receiving end of militarism and then coming to a country where they're the ones carrying out a lot of these military campaigns abroad. Um, and it was really, I think, 9-11 and the Iraq War, as I think for a lot of people in my generation, that kind of just mobilized me into recognizing the, the huge issues of um, militarism and recognizing that I did have the ability to impact that myself instead of just sitting around and always 
you know, being a parts and, and, you know, player that wasn't active in this, I could change things. Uh, Jim's pin, peace demands action, I think is very appropriate in that because it is the collective action that can do these things. Um, and so obviously I was a teenager when 9-11 happened and um, I think it was about 15 or so in the Iraq war and the buildup to it and all the lies and all the romanticization of war was happening. Um, Jim also alluded to that as well. You know, we, so many Hollywood movies looking into battle and, and war zones and soldiers as this, you know, brilliant, epic, heroic thing. And it's like, yeah, of course we, we need to be proud of the people who are willing to sacrifice their lives for us, but the best way to honor them is to not make them sacrifice their lives for us, right? The best way to, to support our troops is to not be sending them into fruitless wars. Um, and so I vividly remember growing up because when I moved to the US, uh, I grew up in the Midwest in Indiana. And so, you know, Trump country, uh, I was not in a popular political opinion of, of being against the war. And I had peers and teachers even telling me to go to Canada if I didn't like it, go back to where I came from, um, that I was unpatriotic and just horrible. And again, I was 15 at the time, so I couldn't vote. So I wore all black when Bush got reelected um, in mourning. And, and one of my teachers threatened to like send me to detention or something. It was just ridiculous that people were so brainwashed by what was happening. Um, and obviously the media is, is responsible for a lot of that. I'm not going to fall down that rabbit hole, but um, you know, sadly they haven't learned and we still see this ongoing. Um, you know, we recently had the 18th year anniversary of that war. And Biden says that, you know, by 9-11, we'll be out of Afghanistan. And we're seeing some of that happening. But, you know, until I, I see it fully realized, I'm not willing to necessarily stop pushing for it because Obama said he wanted out of these wars. Trump said he wanted out of these wars. Which president hasn't said that? And yet we're still there. Um, and so I think you know, um, Jim, Jim's work in uh, New York State Peace Action uh, has allowed me to also meet some of the wonderful students that are part of their network. So they have a phenomenal student network. And I know Martha's met some of them as well during our annual uh, lobby days back before they were virtual. But even after there, there's been some students that attended the virtual ones. Um, and just meeting some of those folks who, you know, were kind of in the same generation, but some of them were literally born after this thing happened. And, and to recognize that there's soldiers over there still to this day who are fighting a war that didn't begin until after they were born is very problematic. And so, um, you know, I, I had always just sort of been drawn to anti-war activism. And after I finished my graduate degree at London School of Economics, I just kind of decided that so much for, um, bureaucratic state work. I, I kind of like the idea as a child of working for the State Department or the United Nations or something. And then I really quickly realized that those agencies can only do so much because bureaucracy really slows down the process and nothing gets done. Um, and they're defunded as we see time and again, the bloated Pentagon budget just eats away at the funding that is needed elsewhere. And so to make a difference, I decided peace action was the way to go. And so I started my job there um, in August of 2016. So it was a really hopeful time as we all remember <laughs> of, of something new on the horizon of change, of finally being able to take steps forward, having just had the big Iran deal victory. Um, and then obviously November, 2016 came around and it was a hit for all of us activists um you know not just the peace community but everyone trump lit fires in every sector you know healthcare uh climate change everything was things that he decided to to attack um but one thing that kept me going at the time when it just really felt like what's the point uh, was this whole community. So the peace action community, um, when I first started, I was one of our development associates. So doing a lot of fundraising on behalf of peace action, because in addition to peace demanding action, it demands 
funding for that action. Um, and so I was lucky enough to meet one-on-one -on -one with a lot of our members, some of whom, you know, had been with us since the Sane Freeze days and, and had started, you know, and had marched with Martin Luther King and, and others um, in that era. And so it was just really inspirational to see that despite what they had gone through and their setbacks and, and the things that they had witnessed, they were still so committed to this process and saw it as, you know, Trump isn't reason to walk away and give up. It's all the more reason to double down and keep pushing because if we weren't here, you know, we would just get steamrolled. And so we just need to fight that much harder. And it was really inspirational and kept me going. Um, as I took on more of the political work at Peace Action, I got to meet, uh, you know, affiliate members and leaders, folks like Martha and Jim, and really just get gain more inspiration from them, um, hearing their stories and about their years of activism was just, I mean, how can it not be inspiring, right? Folks like that just really motivate you to, to push harder and try harder. And so um, certainly just really, really privileged and grateful to be part of this community. Uh, with a few years ago, uh, this latest transition into the um, National Engagement and Campaigns Manager role, I took on a lot more of our electoral work as well. And, um, you know, that's one place that I've seen, you know, that direct impact, very quick direct impact. So folks like Marie Newman, who we helped in her primary against Dan Lipinski, this horrible, horrible Democrat, so-called, um, you know, back in March of 2020, is now coming out with great language and letters around the crisis going on, the war on, on Palestine that's happening, um, you know, and speaking out about Palestinian rights and their importance. And so that is someone that we helped elect directly impacting things. Um, John Ossoff, who we supported in his Georgia race, is also coming out and, and pushing for Palestinian rights and, and speaking out about this issue. And so just being able to see that direct impact has been really helpful in, in that you know, it shows we we can together, we can do this. Um, and the reason that those people are in Congress is because of the activists who came out to support them. The reason that those people are listening to us in Congress is because they know that we have, you know, hundreds of thousands of members nationwide and, and constituents in their state, in their district, who care about these issues and who are going to push them and hold them accountable. And, you know, it's just been really inspirational and has has helped me keep up hope and momentum in obviously I'm sure everyone here recognizes an issue that that's hard because it's it's slow it's an uphill battle and you know I always kind of feel like Sisyphus rolling that rock up the up the hill and you know, with, with Trump, it was just, he made the mountain that much steeper and we had to push that much harder. But um, he also provided an opportunity for a lot of new people who weren't part of this community to jump into it. Uh, I think one benefit or silver lining, whatever you want to call it, of the Trump administration is that folks mobilized more than they ever had before. Folks who never had in the past came out and mobilized. Um, you know, we saw people at the Women's March who had never been to protests before coming into activism. And so as Jim said, now we have these opportunities to get the salmon, get the trout, you know, whatever communities we want to engage with, they're out there. And so we can take that step and go where they are and engage the youth who are coming out, um, you know, around Greta and, and climate change, the communities of color who are being, you know, disproportionately harmed once more during this pandemic as, as usual in this country. Those are the communities that always get the, the fallout of actions that the government takes and, and, you know, missteps of the government first. And so we have opportunities to really engage now and to drive change through our action. And so, um, you know, really appreciate the the membership and support that we have out there in Maine and, you know, really thankful. And so I'd also like to encourage folks today to support Peace Action Maine as well. They're at home and, um, you know, donate to their memberships, renew their memberships, uh, because again, it's, it's critical that we 
stand together and support this movement. Um, and I will also send out a link to register for our upcoming virtual lobby days. So uh, in about a month, June 15th through the 17th, Peace Action National is hosting a virtual lobby days extravaganza. So a three-day conference where there's going to be issue briefings on um, you know, nuclear disarmament, uh, ending endless wars, and cutting the bloated Pentagon budget. And within that, we're going to focus on specific asks and things that we can most impact in Congress right now. And so uh, after that, we're going to, we're also going to incorporate training. So for folks who haven't lobbied or are a little intimidated by it, we'll incorporate that in. And then we'll be um, hosting lobby visits the, the following week and helping folks schedule those and also jumping in and attending. If you know you hesitate and don't want to talk too much, we're happy to have a national staffer there to you know, walk you through the process, but there's other ways that you can engage with National Peace Action, and I'll be here happy to share some resources um, after as well, just because we're running low on time, but I will leave it for questions now, so um, I'm not sure who's facilitating that, but thank you, um, take it's care, Rosalie, thanks for joining. <laughs> in a very casual fashion, facilitating, but uh, no, thanks. It was great to, great to get to, to know you more, and thanks for, for your comments and remarks. I actually maybe have kind of a question that could be answered both by yourself and uh, maybe Jim could add his perspective as well. And this is particularly, you know, regarding the youth and their engagement in different social activism arenas. What I've found most challenging for the peace movement is to try to attract and meet people um, who only have a limited amount of time and resources to offer movements, especially considering some of the financial burdens placed on the young adult generation right now, which consume a lot of our time and what we focus on as we continue to kind of age and, and integrate into the, the adult world. So one of the things that's been on my mind, and Jim, you sparked this thought, you know, specifically in reference to the era of conscription and how the draft, you know, ended, I think maybe 73 or some uh, year close thereafter, and how for some of our wars, wars that we are actively fighting in now, um, have been around since I've been born uh, in, in 94, uh, or, or even longer in our wars uh, in, in the Middle East and, and elsewhere. And the lack of the feeling or the impact of war amongst my generation, because it's just been rather prevalent throughout all of our existence, but not so prevalent in the form of the need to serve in the military or to consider actual warfare as it is in the 21st century, which is dehumanized in the fact that it's it's not face to face. I mean, a lot of what I learned in warfare reflections dating back to World War II is how challenging it is to look someone else in the eyes in that moment you see and understand them as an equal human to you uh, with you know spears or bayonets in your arms ready to to attack and potentially take his life or or lose your own. And that kind of reality of warfare doesn't typically apply. And so we have a difficult time understanding the effects of war um, and, and, and to the point of it being um, around ever since you know, we, we've come into this world. So what conversations, maybe strategies, what, what opportunities exist to, to pull on the intersectionality? And we, we've tried in ways to relate you know, our, our militarism to the climate effects. I mean, you know, the US military is one of the largest consumers of fossil fuels as an institution in the world. But what have you found successful? What can you offer us as maybe, you know, advice and, and guidance on how to make the effects of, of warfare real to, to, to the young adults, to our generation, to ultimately, you know, gather more uh, people, more momentum and more energy to support a cause that seems to by and large be off the radar for for uh, young adults. Um, I can I can start and take a crack at it. Um, and I guess one thing, I mean, I, I grew up in a more political household, so I was always aware of of the wars and and those kinds of things. And I guess right, some of my my peers were not. Um, I would say media coverage is critical, and unfortunately, our media is very, you know, um, does not have great priorities. It's, it's got very skewed priorities, in fact, in this country. But um, foreign coverage has been great to highlight some of the, the issues in the wars. And I think looking at what's happening right now, um, you know, with Palestine, 
one thing I heard in a podcast recently is about how we've seen through the years, um, particularly in the younger generations, the opinion on this shift, right? I, I'd say even a decade ago, um, you know, Israel was infallible. People could not speak out against their policies and, and the, you know, apartheid essentially that they're carrying out um, and, and the things that they're doing. But through the multiple attacks on Gaza through the years, um, you know, under the Bush administration, under Obama and everything, the documentation that happened really allowed younger generations to see the facts on the ground um, in a way that now has folks like Ilhan Omar, Rashid Tlaib, Ayanna Presley, um, you know, Jamal Bowman, Marie Newman, and others speaking out. Um, and as skewed as our media's priorities are on, you know, hot issues and short attention spans and all these things, um, I think that politicians can also be newsmakers, right? So when they come out and they speak, they can drive what's covered. And, um, you know, also social media in terms of younger folks, AOC, um, Ilhan Omar, they have millions of followers that they can impact. So just putting that little extra pressure on them, or, or I mean, they're already kind of doing this, so they don't need to get pressured into it, but thanking them for this, recognizing their work around highlighting these issues, you know, it encourages them to continue doing so. And it reaches that audience of millions in a way that, you know, unfortunately, the news networks are not really doing right now. Um, I had the privilege of interviewing Amy Goodman um, and having a little conversation with her recently with our New Jersey affiliates. And, you know, she is one of the few out there in media who is raising these voices and these issues. And I think that we have an opportunity through our elected officials to spotlight these issues. Um, and obviously we elect them, so they have to listen to us if we put that on their radar, right? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think another route to make folks listen and, and maybe not youth so much, but that, you know, middle generation um, is, is just the money of it. I mean, at the end of the day, how many trillions of dollars have gone into these wars over this amount of time? And, and perhaps it's my cynical self, but for some people who don't care as much about the humanitarian impact, that financial aspect is still something that's like, ooh, could we bring these war dollars home? Particularly when you can't bomb a bridge into being a better bridge. You can't bomb coronavirus out of existence. You can't bomb climate change away. So perhaps instead of putting so much money into the Pentagon, we can bring some of that money back. And what better cut than this endless war that has made neither Iraqis nor Americans nor Afghani people nor anyone else in the world where the war on terror has taken us safer, right? So that's my stab at it. And Jim, I'll hand it off Thank to you. you. Hey, Jim, Thank you. specifically, just kind of the, the absence of, of a draft or that, that lack of connection. I mean, you want, one of the things that resonated with me during your, your, your talk was you, you made an attempt to connect with the people indigenous to the region to learn and understand from them and, and get to know their perspective. I must imagine that that is somewhat of a rare trait or rare action to, to be taken in the military and maybe even how, how was that looked at by your peers? Were, were you know, they in, encouraging? I, I imagine not because that humanizes <laughs> the enemy that they're asking you to fight, but maybe what was the, the demographic or the type of person that would make those conversations and, and how does the now different version of warfare uh, play into, um, you know, the peace movement here in the States? Well, I can tell you, um, my springboard is my faith belief. I'm not talking about religious authenticity. I'm talking about the value of all humans, being able to grapple with that in my own mind, that I'm no different than anybody else and nobody else is different than me. And also factoring, we're in a moment where we talk about restorative justice, right? Well, uh, what does that mean? Restorative justice. If you want to be forgiving, that's a two-way street, but we have to admit it's hard. I would say when it comes to, to the bringing the young people in, in New York State, we have 25 college chapters of Peace Action, of, of, of 25 different colleges and growing. And, and that's one way. 
But I you that the young people today are no different than the old people. They, many of us, before we got to what we knew, this kind of discussion was over our head. We don't talk about nothing nuclear. We ain't talking about foreign policy. But why? Who, who said we couldn't? We're seeing stuff in the papers. We're hearing it on the news. And it's conditioning us to, to accept things. We're seeing politicians that we just not too long ago were talking about holding town halls. When we were growing up, they didn't hold no town hall. Um, nobody was rocking the boat <laughs> or changing the crew. In, in other words, you had, to, you had to be part of that crew that go along with the go along. Here's what I think we need to look at. Young people, just like older people, need their competence and confidence built. And that happens in huddles, in meetings, with your home team, and even when you're speaking out. Because we got to get them to understand that this conversation is not over their head, but this conversation is about them. We have to talk to them in terms that they can feel. There, uh, I often heard Rita Franklin said, uh, give me something that I can feel. Want to feel, you know, when somebody talks to you, you want to you want to feel it. You're a bit somewhere where people talk and it's like dead words that don't move you one way or the other. Well, we need to connect with our young people because they're listening. When, when, when I was in Paris, we had a, uh, in 2017, we had, uh, it was the Paris Peace Movement over there, uh, La, Mou La Movement, uh, La de Paris, or whatever, anyway. Um, and they had a panel of young people there as well as when I was in Hiroshima and in, in Nagasaki. Panel of young people. You know what they all said? And they were coming from different places, from the U.S., the various islands, and, and so forth. They said to the adult, don't stop talking to us. We need you. They said, we know that we can be a little challenging. But don't back off because adults start saying, oh, you can't talk to these young people. How can you say that if you haven't tried? We, we walk past, we want young people to come knowing, but we remember earlier I said about how long we've been around. We do things to them that ingratiate our presence, but don't ingratiate them enough to make them feel like they're equal player with us. We want them at the table, but as people say, not only a seat at the table, but a voice. But we kind of overlook it. Well, I can tell you one thing. The reason I can speak to it, as a person of color, uh, I, I run link side by side with the young people because I, I've been at tables where they wanted people of color, but there was no opportunity to voice. That's why I'm so thankful to Maine that, that at, at this invite. You don't know just how deep it means. But here's the other thing. Think about the songs you know. You didn't pick them, but now you humming them. You know the words. And the only reason for that, you kept hearing them play all over the place. Now you got it down. That's how our conversation needs to be. But we haven't been like that with the young people. And, and if we were, instead of having like a meeting here and then three weeks or three months later, we have another, that's not enough to grow the understanding for people young or old. Because meanwhile, those who are pushing another narrative 24 seven, ain't that what we see in the paper and here on these shock jocks all the time? So what we have to do is have a consistent voice, but we also need to wrap it in the flavor of what they do. I got young people here in Buffalo doing what I call flash peace, peace teach outs. And that's where it's been come together, we know what we're going to talk about, have a flyer, go to different business parts of the city where people are moving to and from. We don't call a rally, don't do nothing. Just show up, no flash mob light. Many of them be handing out information flyers and somebody will be on the mic or they always tell you, you got to have a authorization to use a bullhorn. But many of us have strong voices and we'll just spend a half an hour there talking on the issue handing out sheets on it and how to get in touch with us and then move on.org to another location. 
And this is to keep up with the kind of frame of movement and, and the multitasking that young people have ushered in that as we age, we can still do. I think showing, having young people in, in the room and doing role playing, both young and old on the issue, that builds not only the understanding and ownership, but that'll begin to build, increase both the competence and the confidence so that when it comes to a time when they have to stand alone, they can stand. So when it comes to time, when they come in those environments where they see a connection in and the need for what we know, they're able to do it. They're ready for it. It's just that our organization, remember I said infrastructure change, our infrastructure of organizations haven't changed. There's so many of them coming forward we we can't handle the other thing is we don't have enough money for them because many of those who are in college uh got bills 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 so they can't do a lot of volunteer stuff we need to impress upon some of the funders hey we need more you know if, if they're going to give us a grant we we know we need help but that doesn't that's no reason to explain to the young people in the world that you're trying to build we won't necessarily have this problem but for right now, and because you got skin in the game, you got to be part of this fight. Remind them that you are the Greta Thornburgs of the moment. And, and we got them on every issue. I would also say that we have to fish in both ponds, not just the collegiate in the, in the schools, but also in the community. Because, you know, we, we, we can pull those who are in college where the college is you know, they have to have a club and so forth. That's one way. But the kind of work that has to go on daily and, and consistently, they can't do because they're trying to study. So we have to invest in the community. And it's at that gate where we bring our understanding about the connecting points into all those different areas. I, I head up, as you saw, I'm the state vice president for citizen action in New York. Citizen Action of New York is a social justice movement uh, uh, organization. And, and they haven't taken a strong grip, but you know what to do? Around their annual gatherings and so forth, a leadership conference, I argue and forge in a workshop that deals with foreign policy, get speakers in there uh, who can speak on it. And just to drop a tab, just to start challenging some who nothing gonna change. Oh, you know why? Because I understand the world is here. When even in, in, in with the immigration concern, so many young people are, are connected to that. All we have to help others know is that people not leaving home because they wanna come here so bad. They're leaving home because of the military action we're doing in their countries that make it impossible for the plant to grow. and and the numbers of young people whose lives are being cut short. I say that is a, a harvest and we just need to build up and straighten ourselves to, to bring them in. Uh, they're ready to come in. They're gonna do it without us. Same thing with the black community because while the peace movement doesn't embrace these two groupings, what will happen, they will come up with their own mind about how to survive and it won't just be them, it'll be the the political leadership that is kind of toning them down, give them a little something and keeping them distracted from seeing the bigger picture. Uh, young people are ready and we can, and we need to keep talking to them more and more, more and more. Thank you, Jim. You said 25 chapters in New York. Yeah, we were, we were. Man, that's close. dynamite, man. That, that, that's yeah. hearty impressive. Yeah, and it, I noticed uh, an interesting. It, mm -hmm. I noticed an mm -hmm. interesting um, connection between what um, Lily and Jim had to say, and it has to do with that sort of ubiquitous nature of uh, militarism and uh, sort of the. Uh, it's a given that it, there's toxic masculinity. I'm so glad that term got out there. It's why we need certain voices to just peg things and say the way they need to be said. Um, 
but you know, just sort of this given of this uh, aggressive nature, militarism that that seeps. It's actually quite scary. As I was listening to Jim, as well as um, the recording, um, um, you know, by Dr. Antondi, I'm thinking, God, this is the this is the context I grew up in as a small child, where the whole environment is basically kind of dripping with this. You know, fast forward to like flags hanging on pickup trucks and things mm. and i'm like you know i look at flags and even ones that are like just they're just sports teams and i'm i kind of have to wince a little bit because like you know it makes me think of like something sort of aggressive um mm -hmm. but what and lily said that was so interesting and this kind of brings up sort of a gr dramatic irony in the context of um uh, of, of of the george floyd and the defund the police thing is that they're literally the word defunding i mean we get sort of tripped up in this semantics and we know it's not about defunding even, you know, the opposition would like to sort of peg us and say, you know, <clears throat> as an excuse that that's being unrealistic, that's being over the moon. <clears throat> but the reality of it behind the debate is peace is getting and justice is getting defunded, has been defunded through, you know, default by investing so much in the military. And that's something unique I took from what Lily had to say. It just clicked in my head. I, I appreciate your, your comments. You hit on a, on a <clears throat> real topic that with that word defund, see, sometimes we have to be the ones to, to elevate the understanding like a lot of groups starting to do. We have to give some context to it. Because if you were to say cut the Pentagon budget, isn't that like saying defund the Pentagon? <laughs> and, and 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 at the same time, people would say it, uh, acting like they don't get it. They know we're not talking of getting rid of some kind of policing structure. And they're trying to push it to make it seem like we're on the whacked off end. That's why we have to be the ones feeding the context regularly until people understand it mm -hmm. so that they don't get tricked by those who right. hyping them on the defund. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, um, I mean, and, and definitely you don't see folks asking when these Pentagon spending increases are always thrown out with each new budget, right, um, where that money is going to come from. Everyone's always saying, well, how are we going to fund the Green New Deal? How, how are we going to fund this big infrastructure bill? How are we going to fund all these other things? And yet, when it comes to the military, it's just this given almost in our society that Oh well, yeah, we'll we'll dig up another thirteen billion for the military. We'll we'll find ways to keep funding the F thirty five fighter jets that literally just don't work, and the Navy has come out and said that they don't work. Um, you know, we'll we'll find money for that, even though um, I can't remember if it was Jim or Brenton or somebody had mentioned. Um, or I think it was Breton who mentioned, obviously, that the military industrial complex is one of the biggest polluters. Um, and, and it's also not a good job creator. Um, when it comes to the jobs, I mean, so many members of Congress are, are hesitant to cut the jobs, right? So it's like we have this naval base, um, which I think Maine actually has one that you share with New Hampshire or something like that. Um, you know, we have this naval base, we have this, this Air Force base, we have this weapons manufacturer company in town. And that gives jobs to people. Well, it's been found time and again, um, you know, Brown's Cost of War project that, that comes out annually and, and others have found that, you know, military jobs aren't as efficient or effective and, and they don't provide as many jobs as other sectors could. And particularly when it comes to the green sector, uh, which right now with this infrastructure bill, there's also gonna be an infrastructure sector in need of jobs. You know, it just takes that little bit of training and, and reallocation. And I think, you know, it kind of ties to defund as well as, as a term because that's where folks just want to cling on defund as an aspect when it actually comes down to just reallocation, right? We're just putting these resources into a sector or into, you know, an idea that, will work toward actually carrying out the goals we claim we have versus something that we've shown time and again does not work, right? 20 exactly. years into Afghanistan, have we shown it work? Have we, have we achieved our goals? Have we realized anything? No, in fact, we've, you know, provided this training to their military forces that has just left them dead. You know, you look at the, the casualty figures and it's like, 
5,000 or so, um, you know, NATO and American troops, which is tragic, but then hundreds of thousands of Afghani police and, and army members who we're supposed to be training and helping. So it's like, if it's not effective, you don't have to be fun per se, but you can reallocate those resources towards That's something right. that works. Um, and I think it's all of those connections that, that Jim alluded to that are really gonna help us expand the movement because this is an issue that really does just reach across the board and, mm -hmm. and impact all these communities um, and the youth, people of color, indigenous communities, just everybody that can become part of this movement. But you know, in, in asking that of them, we also have to be ready to be there for them, right? So we can't just ask folks to show up for us and be part of our movement. We have to then in return, be there for their causes and be there for their marches and, and make it a two-way street where, you know, intersectionality comes together and we focus on these issues together. The only way we can Thank really you. make an impact. Thank you. You, got, you know, I wanna to add to that also, one of the things we haven't done well is showing other issue areas where their money is. If, if, you, if you look at uh, uh, um, the Pentagon budget and see how much is going to them at the polls to energy, health and stuff, and, and start saying to the social justice group, hey, look, you've been robbed. You know, the reason you don't have money is because your money was shifted off and put in that budget. The Poor People Campaign got a song, I think they sing it says, uh, uh, I went down to the master house and I took back what they stole from me and I took back my dignity and it's under my feet, under my feet, something like that. My point is, we need to seize upon that kind of stuff and get people to understand, hey, look, we're going to get what was taken from human needs. Who are you at war with, climate people? Who are you at war with, immigration people? Who are you at war with, education, housing, healthcare? Nobody? Then why are we let the government, these wayward politicians, put all our money into building more toys that would take us into war beyond and talking about a space force? <laughs> In fact, the space force is being kind of hinted at it would be great to have the nuclear program in there. Okay, we're talking about doing away with this nuclear stuff and they are we're thinking about ways to institutionalize it more. Who sleep, us or them? See, the, the villain is constantly doing their thing. We caught up in, well, you know, I'm retired now or, you know, I'm getting older. You still on the planet <laughs> for a while we got it? I say to, to, to my generation, because I just hit 72 to uh, April 13th. We're in a moment. I, I, I like to think that, look, I may be aging down, but I'm not going to tiptoe out quiet. I'm going to make some noise, leave a trail. I encourage everybody who's up in, in chronological numbers in their age to do the same thing. Don't just disappear. They say, well, where are they at? Let them say, you know, Martin went this way. Stephen went that way. This is what they stood for. It's like they said in that little book that many people read, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. It didn't say stop shining it when you get a little age. So anyway, that's, it's all about the spirit of life for itself and the planet and the rest of humanity. If we get into that tune, everything we do will resonate with it. And it don't have to be a whole lot. It's like a baseball player up the bat. It's not whether you hit the ball out of the park, it's whether you swing. If you swing and strike out, we can tell you how to adjust. If you don't swing, we don't know what it means. Well said, hey, well said. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jim, mm -hmm. thank you. And Lily, thank you. You both have been more than gracious with, with your time with us this morning and into the afternoon. So we'll let you uh, shuttle away to enjoy the rest of this uh, beautiful day. If you missed it in the introductions, Jim Anderson, president of Peace Action New York State and vice president on statewide board Citizen Action of New York. Lily Dragnev from National Peace Action is our national engagement and campaigns manager. I wanted to plug, Lily, what you put in the chat if anyone listens to this recording and wants to become more engaged on the national level. 
um, Lily hosts or is involved in at the least in a, a national peace action uh, coordination event with biweekly uh, affiliate calls for different chapters across the country. I imagine Jim uh, might be on those uh, as well. And uh, our dear sure Martha is. here uh, <laughs> from Maine Peace Action represents us honorably, but that uh, information will be made available with a link to this video recording. Uh, and I think we will probably, uh, Martha, have a distinct link for uh, Vincent's speech so everyone can uh, watch it uh, in its entirety and capture his uh, message in full. But I certainly hope this is not the last time, uh, Jim oh, no. and Lily, you will uh, join a, an event of ours. And it was uh, delightful to have you. Uh, really, we can't thank you enough for your perspective and um, the conversation that we had today. Yes. Thank, thank you, you so all. much. Thank you Love for having you, us. <laughs> Pardon my allergies. Hopefully next time I join, I'll be a little less sniffly, but thank you so much. <laughs> and hope to, hope to see more of you um, on these biweekly calls or at least our uh, national organizers meeting, the, the virtual lobby days that we are having in June. And so all of that will be shared linkwise. and have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank Take you again so you. much all right. for having us. Forward thank ever. you. Howdy, team. Hey Is there. It, just saying, hey. I'm going to do stop live stream. Stop recording, right? Stop recording.